you can see off in the distance what appears to be a cave. As you approach the cave, you see that there is a large opening. Enter the cave. You are surprised to see that it is filled with light. The light refracted from millions of crystals, reflecting every color of the rainbow. If you listen carefully, you might hear their song.
and now you come upon a high chamber. Brilliant, open, blazing with light. At the center of this chamber is a pool, clear and beautiful. This is a magical place. You see the light of a hundred crystals reflected in the pool. Stop here and rest. Thank you.
The higher you climb, the less people you meet on the trail. By noon of the ninth day, you reach a pass nearly 12,000 feet in elevation. It's difficult to breathe, and ice covers the puddles. Zipping the down jacket snugly, you pull the hood over your head. Marpa turns to you and says, It's time. Looking at him strangely, you ask, Time for what? Come, he says, turning to walk towards a large outcropping of rocks. When Marpa disappears behind a boulder, you follow and are surprised to find that he has entered a cave. You have to stoop to get through the opening, which within a few feet expands into a huge cavern of winds that are blowing from somewhere deep within. Stopping to find the flashlight in your backpack, you call out for Marpa to wait. Now, flashlight in hand, you proceed carefully. The walkway is flat and easy to follow, but Marpa has gone ahead. Continuing through the twists and turns of the cavern, you wonder about the temperature. It's at least 40 degrees warmer than outside, and the breeze smells tropical. The deeper you go into the cave, the more your footsteps echo off the rock wall. Rounding a bend, your flashlight beam illuminates Marpa, waiting for you at the top of a stairway. You shine the light down the stairs, which appear to descend into the bowels of the earth. The stairs are not like the steps on the trekking trail. These are carved of stone and perfectly set into place, and the walls of the stairway glow with an eerie blue luminescence. You go... Marpa says, pointing down the stairway. You shake your head, not understanding. The masters await you. Go now, he says, smiling. But aren't you coming? You ask, so concerned about the situation that you fail to recognize the quality of Marpa's English. He shakes his head. It's your time. It's why you were here. You look from Marpa down the stairway back to Martha, but he isn't there. The masters again. What is it about the master? Within your question comes a sense of tranquility and you feel drawn to follow the stairway which curves as it descends and descends and descends, seemingly never ending. It takes you nearly an hour to reach a landing in an arched window that looks out upon a tropical world far below. Looking up, you see a circle of sky and realize this is an extinct volcano and you've been circling down the mountain within a tunnel stairway. But how could anyone have constructed such a thing, especially here in the middle of the Himalayas? And why? Again, you start to descend. Down, down down into another world. Alternating waves of apprehension and exhilaration flood your mind. Upon finally reaching the bottom of the stairwell, you stop and stare in disbelief, rubbing your eyes as if to test the reality of the sight. A tiered temple sits at the end of a winding walkway, leading through an immaculate garden of flowers and tropical trees. High above, waterfalls descend from several openings in the walls of the volcano. For a moment, you consider turning around and hurrying back up the stairs before you're discovered, but you don't do it. Something is pulling you toward the temple, and you decide to go along with the energy rather than fighting it. You follow the path through the garden across a bridge directly to the steps leading up to the temple. You hesitate a moment, then slowly open the door. The scent of rich incense wafts out of the temple, and in a flash of deja vu, you sense this is a familiar aroma. But from where? When? Stepping into the temple, you hear a chorus of voices say, Welcome. We've been waiting for you. It takes
takes a moment to visually adjust to the dim light. We know who you are and why you are here. Come, sit. Are you willing to trust us? Yes. How do we begin? You glance up at two discs suspended above your head. The discs begin to vibrate and hum, and from the center of the discs, a ray of shimmering, iridescent golden light projects down on the top of your head. Focus upon the light and sound entering your crown chakra of spirituality. Thank you. 
Most of us are fascinated with people who go out into the world on their own, without any hindrances or obligations, without feeling the need to address or consider others' needs. From fanciful characters like Forrest Gump, to real-life pioneers like Diane Fossey, such lonesome travelers often have strong principles and ideological motivations. In John Krakauer's best-selling book, Into the Wild, Chris McCandless, a superior student and athlete in his early 20s, leaves his ordinary life behind and heads for the Alaskan wilderness. Traveling alone, with minimal gear, Chris makes his way toward Alaska with the goal of living off the land without the help of other human beings. Throughout his journey, Chris engages people who want to make him a part of their lives, including an elderly man who offers to adopt him, a young girl who falls in love with him, and a couple who invites him to live with them. Chris, however, is determined to make it on his own. Before reaching his final destination, Chris has his last human interaction with a man named Gallium, who has given him a ride. During the drive south toward the mountains, Gallion had tried repeatedly to dissuade Alex, Chris's pseudonym, from his plan to no avail. He even offered to drive Alex all the way to Anchorage so he could at least buy the kid some decent gear. No thanks anyway, Alex replied. I'll be fine with what I've got. When Gallion asked whether his parents or some friend knew what he was up to, anyone who could sound the alarm if he got into trouble and was overdue, Alex answered calmly that no, nobody knew of his plans, that in fact he hadn't spoken to his family in nearly three years. I'm absolutely positive, he assured Gallion. I won't run into anything I can't deal with on my own. After parting from Gallion, Chris crosses a frozen river and ventures deep into the bush where he's completely isolated from the outside world. For several months, Chris makes it on his own, foraging and hunting for food. The next spring, however, when he tries to return home, he discovers the river is swollen with rain and melting snow, and the current is so strong that he's unable to cross back into civilization. Left with no other choice, Chris returns to his base camp, where he ultimately dies. In his last days of life, he makes the following entry in his journal. Happiness only real when shared. <laughs>